Welcome to Back to the Roots podcast. This is Brian Wood, and today Mike Klein and myself are sitting down with Jonathan Yoder, who is a dairy farmer from Topeka, Indiana, and a young farmer. And that's primarily what we wanted to talk to Jonathan today about, was starting up his farm and starting off with uh, heifers and really getting this farm back into dairy. Um, but before we jump into all those kinds of questions, why don't you just give us a background of the farm and, and family and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, like Brian said, my name is Jonathan, and uh, we live on an 83-acre farm. Uh, me and my wife and seven children, aged 11 and under. And I guess the farm has been in the family for quite some time now, Uh, early 1900s, 1920s, 19 to 29, somewhere in that area, it was purchased by my great-great-grandfather, so we've been uh, blessed to have it passed down to us. And now, when I first came here, this was probably four years ago, four or five years ago at this point, uh, there wasn't a dairy here. You know, there was dairy barns and facilities, but uh, it was not a working dairy. I believe you had goats at that point, I think. Uh, so w- let's go back to what was being done before you got on the farm and then what brought you or what made you think about coming back to dairy. And I guess, first of all, was it a dairy in, in those early years? And then what took the family out of that? Well, uh, when I I grew up here, my dad got it, got the place in the late 80s. And there was uh, grade B bulk. It was not set up for grade A milk. And the market was not there to, and the help wasn't here, uh, sufficient to make a living from it. So the dairy was let go. Uh, we raised hogs and then later heifers, a lot of grazing. And then last of all, my dad had goats before we took over. Was that dairy goats or meat goats? We had meat goats. It was all grazing. We had about 60 acres of permanent pasture and then various hay fields where we made hay two or three cuttings a year just for uh, what we needed on the farm. So then what made you get the idea for coming back to dairy? Were you working off the farm prior to that and then what brought you back in? So when Laura and I got married in 2006. I was working at a trailer factory. And uh, one by one, our family grew. And I always dreamed that I wanted to be home and make a living at home with my family and teach my children responsibility and and uh, to be there while the family's growing up. But nothing really... It didn't really seem possible until uh, some of the neighbors started selling uh, into the niche market, uh, organic, and all of a sudden it started to dawn on me that maybe we could set up a dairy and remodel some barns and uh, and, uh, start an organic dairy, and and, uh, it kind of has been a dream come true. Mm-hmm. And what did I know when I first came here? You were looking at remodeling a hog barn into a milking parlor. Uh, whatever came of that, I don't think that's where you wound up, right? You wound up using some of the older facilities, but remodeling into. Actually, we did. Uh, we had a small fail to finish operation back in the late 80s, early 90s, and then in 94 when the hog market uh, went kerbonk, I guess, uh, we quit that. And the hog barns, just a small, just two small hog barns. One was a gestation barn, one was a farrowing 
uh, barn had been sitting empty ever since 94. And so we took the farrowing part and made a milk house and a milking parlor, tore out all the concrete and remodeled it. And the old barn, the original barn that was probably the first building that was put up on this place uh, back in 1880s, we uh, completely gutted the the bottom of that, the underside of that, and made a 40-cow freestall barn out of it. So that's what I'm thinking of is the renovation of the old barn for the freestalls. And are you milking around 40 cows at this point? or? Uh, this morning we had 37 in. We're almost to peak. I thought we might hit 38 this year, but that's going to be about it. Sure. And you started with all heifers? Yes. How fun was the milking for the first couple weeks? Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was uh it was an adventure. Rodeo? Yeah, and yet it wasn't as bad as I had anticipated because of uh we have a double six low line parlor where uh the cows, the heifers, as heifers, they could kind of all come in together, and they didn't really see us, so it really helped. But there were always some um, ornery ones. Because generally you try to pinch the heifers in between the older cows when they first freshen, and if you've got all heifers, you can't do that. Yeah, now when we have fresh heifers... Uh, so for two years we didn't have fresh heifers, and uh, till the the first calves grew up, and all of a sudden I'm looking at my wife when we're out there having a rodeo, and I say, "How did we do it with all heifers?" <laughs> well, you brought up one point that that I think uh, all heifer startups deal with, but talking to somebody about it, I want to make sure to ask is. Uh, going from, you know, you're freshening in, what was it, 20 to 25 animals or 30 animals? I'm not sure exactly how many. What did you What did you freshen in that first go around? So in August, our cows were not quite, our heifers were not quite done transitioning, but they started freshening in August of 2015, and we went on the conventional truck about September 1st I believe it was and and then from then through October we had about 20 fresh heifers and then uh, through November December we had a few more and then January February we went all the way up to 42 heifers Mm -hmm. but then from that point to 2017 here just a year ago you basically had no replacements. No, I. Uh, that was all I had then, and they were offset enough so that we never went below about 21, 22 uh, in the parlor. So, yeah, that was that was basically it. Mm-hmm. But that definitely seems to be in that first two years where the struggle is, is that you're probably milking cows that, don't belong in the parlor they're not paying their rent so to speak but you can't afford you can't afford to milk them and you can't afford to not milk them is essentially what it comes down to um how did you navigate through that and did you just have to deal with it and wait for your heifers to come in or were you getting rid of cows or what were you doing during that time i kind of had to wait for on my heifers uh, there was always those few that uh, we'd be milking, and I'd tell my wife, now, when if we just have one or two more heifers here, then I'd just love to get rid of this cow, but we had to keep her. Um, and for the most part, you know, we had, we went down from 42 to 38, so we did, we, we were able to call a few here and there. Uh, Mm-hmm. That's one thing that I've noticed. Something that works really well for somebody who wants to start off with heifers is to have 
you know, when you start your herd transition, have some that are a year younger, you know, maybe just half a dozen or so. So you've got replacements coming in at the end of year one. Uh, that way you don't have to wait until the end of year two. Uh, and it's the cost is, is pretty low for that five, six head uh, in case you do need them. That would have been a very good. I guess the other thing that I didn't mention, uh, I actually had 47 heifers to begin with. So when the first first uh, year, the first time they calved, they came around, we had something that we didn't like at all. We had no mercy. We, we called them. We did not hang on to stuff we didn't want. And that brought us all the way down to 42 by the time we were done calving the first lactation that was a big plus but it would so definitely you had extra enough head that you could get rid of the problem the first time they started milking okay so i did yeah i did have 47 to begin with yeah and i i hate to say it but you were kind of also my learning curve on for heifer startups too you know in recommending what mike just said is to have you know, probably even three groups your initial group of heifers freshening in, that'll give you the bulk of your animals, but then six months after that, another group, six months after that, another group, and six months after that, another group. So you've got over a year and a half, you've got a few cows coming in in order to replace some that you don't need. And, you know, like Mike said, it's a relatively minimal cost. There's definitely some cost involved. But, you know, during those times, uh, replacement heifers were selling for fairly good prices and cull cows were also still fairly good. Now today with the markets doing what they're doing, it may be a pretty significant loss, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, I watched the heifer startups and this is part of the reason we wanted to talk to you is that there's definitely that, that major struggle for the first well it's probably it winds up being three to four years but that especially that first two years and did you ever have to get a off-farm job were you working off-farm part-time or you were you able to get through uh, without having to go do something like that I had gotten most of my money private and the bank didn't like me. I did my own remodeling and thereby did not have a steady job for the last year. So they didn't really look at me. I had planned on refinancing. So after the first, for the first year, my creditors were mostly family relatives. And they all said, you know, we want you to get started and just don't worry about it. So for a for a full year, I had only my previous farm credit loan that uh, I had to make payments on. So I could, I could, I had quite a bit of money uh, to help me get finished setting up and getting through that first year. It really helped a lot. Mm -hmm. That's a huge benefit because mm -hmm. anybody that does have to go through the banks. I've watched it happen. A lot of them have to get off farm jobs in order to uh, make ends meet for that for that year or so between when they're waiting for replacements to come in and get up to the numbers that they're hoping to be at. Um, and I see things suffer a little bit during that time because what they're I know what they're going for. It's a steady paycheck in order to pay the bills. Um, but they're also spending a lot of time off the farm that, uh, you know, basically what they make off the farm is replaced with losses on the farm. And, and it doesn't always wind up being, it winds up being close to a zero sum game is what, what I've seen. But also on top of that, you can really burn yourself out running you know, at the trailer factory is what are you working five o'clock in the morning till one o'clock in the afternoon or somewhere in there? Yeah, that's and, and I do. I didn't mention, but I do. I do actually at the present time work away some. I didn't for the first year and a half, but I am working at a pallet shop uh, two to three days a week. Uh, but only on the seasons when I'm not tied up doing field work and stuff like that mm -hmm. 
So I do, and, and it's only five hours a day. So I do work away some, and it, like you said, it feels like I should more, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you win here, you lose there. That's kind of how it works. Yeah. Well, and I guess I kind of see it as, uh, you know, you, you got to put in your time early. You know, none of these guys that have been farming for 20, 30 years had it easy for the first five years either. And, you know, you look at some of these guys that have been around for a long time, they're able to travel off the farm and have funds in order to do things that they want to do. And, you know, that definitely looks enticing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I really admire the young farmers that are having to make a go of it and are really struggling right now, you know, with prices down, like we talked about, and being somewhat constrained on milk production. That's a whole nother, whole nother aspect of the ball game. That that uh, you know, um, with a quota system in place, you know, you're locked in at a certain amount of production, and only getting paid for that, but need to be higher. And um, but you know, I think in the end, you know, if you slog through it, it's there will be payoff in the end is the way I see it. That's, that's what we hope for. (laughs) Always looking for that light at the end of the tunnel, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, are there some things that if somebody was going to start off with a heifer herd like you did, would there be things you would encourage them to do differently than you did? You know, did you, did you realize later that, boy, I should have, you know, maybe staggered my breeding a little bit more? So you don't have, that's another thing that I've noticed is they put a bull in with the entire herd of heifers, breed them all, everything freshens in three weeks. Well, nine months down the road, after they're bred, you know, after they freshen, all of a sudden you've almost got no income for six weeks. And that's a real snag. So would you have spread out the, because you said you spread the breeding out, would you have done that even more or is there something you would do differently? Yeah, I think I would, you know, like Brian mentioned, have six more heifers for maybe six months later. And for the most part, I think I would I would do what I did again, except, yeah, maybe maybe a few more heifers start, you know, here and there along the way. Um, I guess that's about it. I, I had a lot of good advice. I had neighbors... I had uh, the calf program to really help me out. They they spent time, and I talked with a few more guys that had heifer startup, and I had a lot of different advice. And between it all, I think I think I came out pretty good on it. Mm-hmm. Could you explain or Brian the the calf program? What that actually is? Oh, uh, there's. Uh, a group of people got together, and uh, they're trying to help. It's a community assisting local farmers is what the CAF stands for. And uh, basically, people put money in uh, various different sources and to try to help the new farmer get ahead so he can stay at home and do his work on the farm that needs to be done instead of Likely, we were talking about going out and uh, working in the factory and trying to do two two whole jobs at once. And the nice part, too, is that, well, there's two two main parts. is a low-interest loan, and then on top of that, you have to have mentors that come and help out, and that's what Jonathan was referring to. And I think that's probably more, just as equal as the money part and the low interest loan. And also the the payback on the loan is delayed for two years Mm -hmm. uh, so that they can get on, you know, young farmers can get on their feet. But then also access to experienced farmers that have been through some of these things as a resource to call during those times when you got questions and um yeah it's that that's just as valuable as the money side of things i think there were quite a few times uh that year when i was setting things up and uh 
when I was ready to, you know, just, it just looked uh, maybe overwhelming. And, and, and I'd go talk with these uh, neighbors and, and uh, these, these, the board that was on the CAF program. And by the time I'd get back, I would, you know, it would look completely different. So I give neighbors and, and support from the community is huge when starting up something like this. Mm-hmm. And you have, what are there, uh, five organic farmers right within a mile or two? Within a mile. Yeah, yeah. That's a huge asset to have when getting started on something like this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, and, you know, I think there's a number of aspects that you have to learn. It's the, cow side it's the cropping side it's the grazing side uh where were the biggest questions or you know you had the background of grazing a little bit with heifers and goats so i'm assuming that was probably at least you had some knowledge there but was it cows was it cropping or was it grazing i guess the biggest hurdle i grew up we used to have some corn uh we did some farming all through my lifetime and I was familiar with farming in general but the thing that was the biggest uh, change for me was uh, getting uh, I guess learn the learning curve for starting you know we had heifers all my life but to actually have those heifers freshen and and then we to know what to do with the cow, what to do with the calf, and when they should be bred back, and if they were clean, it was just it was kind of overwhelming to. But uh, we grew into it, and it it's uh, it's just uh, it comes without even thinking about it now. Mm-hmm. Three years later, mm-hmm. and it's probably it's hard for somebody to really give a person like you advice because when you ask them. When do you breed them back? It's it's ingrained in everything that a dairy farmer does. So it's not something that's really talked about is the, like a cow freshening. Well, did she clean? You know, all of that stuff, you never hear really guys talk about that. I'm guessing when, when the calves started dropping is when reality really set in quick. Yeah. And, and there again, there were neighbors with five of them within a mile and they were there, uh, they didn't really come up so much as, but I could go down and ask him for advice. I guess the thing that really uh, kind I kind of think back and laugh about is when the the guy was here setting up my parlor. Uh, he was here for a few weeks, you know, getting the equipment put in and installed, and and finally we were milking a few dairy uh, heifers by hand, and and. Uh, I was getting desperate. We got to get this thing hooked up. So finally they got the vacuum line hooked up. And that night it was time to milk when he left. And I turned to him. I said, okay, so I know how to make the vacuum run. So how does the milker work? He looked at me (laughs) like I was crazy. (laughs) And I wasn't really, that was the type of thing. I didn't worry about it. It was, I was busy setting up. I was busy doing construction projects and all of a sudden it was here and I was like, okay, so how do I operate this thing? It was completely new to me. It's, I think of the same thing. You know, I, I worked on my uncle's dairy farm and it's the same thing on the cropping side. You know, you look at a field and a farmer that does this year after year just knows where to put that plow on the ground and how to make that furrow. And, I, you know, I, I look at it, and I'm like, where would I even start? You know, where, where do I even start? It's the same thing with, you know, it, it's just some of these things, like Mike said, with, you know, farmers, it's so, they do it every day, two times a day, as far as milking goes, or every year they're doing field work. And it's just something that's so ingrained, and a lot of these guys grew up doing it. And so when you ask the question, I think it does help some of these older guys to actually take a step back and say, okay, well, why do I really do it that way? And I think, you know, I have talked to some of the guys that work as or that volunteer as mentors for the CAF program. 
And they said it helps them just as much as it does the young guy because they got to step back and and ask the question of, okay, well, how am I going to explain this to somebody that needs to know how to do it? Mm -hmm. So the first year we had, uh, uh, we we put away hay that first year before the heifers freshened, and I wrapped some. I got the a guy uh, come came around and he wrapped it for me, and I was gonna get a head start on having some dairy hay here. And uh, well, by the time it was all said and done, I think I uh, ended up hauling most of it away for manure. <laughs> <laughs> because it was so it was so ripe when we cut it i didn't know that was another thing we always we always just the hay had to be started to bloom or well blooming before we'd cut it because we had hay for heifers or horses or or meat goats it wasn't dairy hay so that was that was another major learning curve for me and 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 with that i had to learn all that and and a few of my neighbors down the road that were giving me advice, all of a sudden I was getting advice from all over and <laughs> learning and reading and doing, trying different things than they had ever done. And all of a sudden um, I start noticing that they're asking me questions. Well, how how did you how did you get this quality test on this forage? How how did you get it that high? They're rethinking the way they do things too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, I think it takes somebody new coming in and asking. And, you know, I think that's a, definitely something for a young farmer is it might be a little bit scary to ask those what may seem like a silly question to these guys that have been doing it for a long time. But it takes somebody coming in and asking those questions in order to uh, change up the way that things are done. And I know, uh, well, this last year, you had some 200 RFQ hay, some really high quality feed, right? That yeah, I had some last year that was 229. This year, my highest is like 239. Uh, but yeah, it's. I think some of it has to do with soil, and mm-hmm. and and I think, I think fertility is a little bit overrated in my experience now. I'm as short as it is, I think timing is the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. So do you do you cut it at thirty days, thirty one days, twenty eight days, or do you just go by how the crop is maturing? I cut it at twenty eight days. Twenty eight days. Cut twenty eight days, uh, weather permitting. If I see, I do pretty intensive uh, watching the forecast, and I write everything, every detail down. I watch the direction of the wind, the sun. Uh, you know, is it going to be cloudy? And I try to, I try to uh, cut my hay so that I have two really sunny days. I like to have one sunny day after the rain to get the sugar levels up and get the ground dried out a little bit. And then I like to cut it and then fluff it up where a lot of people don't mess with. I think it's very important to fluff that hay just like when you would dry it, just to get that bottom stuff up and get the sugar higher in the plant i think that really helps as are some of the things that I do a little different than all most. baleage most of my hay is just baleage i focus on dairy hay as i do not have enough for other okay. animals uh, i purchase a lot of hay for horses and dry cows and mm-hmm. now so. on on do you you don't do hay in a day. You, well, you would mow today, ted it, and then bale it the next day. Would I would you? generally. I don't. I don't. That's another thing I learned. Uh, my quality is a lot higher if I wait till at least twelve o'clock. Uh, sometimes I push if I have a lot to cut, maybe ten forty-five, eleven o'clock. But I don't like to cut early in the morning, and then. Uh, I have made hay in a day, but seldom. With horses, it's very hard. Uh, it's it's a very intensive day's work to try and get chores done plus be out in the field all day. So what I usually do is I wait. I just cut it one day, and the next day, once the neighbors are already raking, I go out with a tether 
and I'm always late. The neighbors are always uh, going away for the evening, and, and I'm still out there just ready to start raking hay. So I usually it's usually dark when we're done baling hay, but it, it seems to make very good quality that way. Mm-hmm. Do you use a sickle bar or a, or a hay bine or disc bine? I have a New Holland 48, 488 hay bine, okay. and I do what the universities say is wrong. I'd crimp it. I yeah I don't know but it seems to work for me so mm-hmm. well I liked what Ernest Weaver when we had a meeting earlier this year uh, he was talking about hay in the day and how to improve forage quality and you spoke up and said okay well you know I've got 230 RFQ hay and would you recommend I go to hay in a day I can't remember if that was the exact question <laughs> and Ernest just looked at him and said. I wouldn't change a thing you're doing. <laughs> he was kind of stumped. And finally, he didn't know what to say. And finally, he looked at me and said, if you got 200 plus RFQ consistently, then you better keep on doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of the the Amish and Holmes County have gone away from the hay bind or the disc bind simply because of weight uh, in our hills with horses. Uh, where the I and J, the double sickle bar, uh, works wonderfully. Uh, and if you're making baleage, it actually shows that it dries down to 65% faster without being crimped. But if you want it drier than that, after lower than 65% moisture is where the, the conditioning really speeds up the process. So if you're making baleage, most of them think, most of them will mow it with a sickle bar, take the tether over it, and then... You know, to fluff, like you said, fluff that up and let the air flow through it and get more more surface out there for the sun to be on. Mm-hmm. And I, I've experimented. I still have the old number nine sickle bar horse-drawn mowers here. And I've experimented this summer again, but I always have more success because I don't like to make hay at 65% moisture. Mm-hmm. I like my hay to be 39% moisture, 33 to 39%. Uh, this year it wasn't possible. We had more rain than we've ever had in recent history. So my hay is more like uh, 40, uh, 45 to 55 percent moisture. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was just a year you couldn't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, I couldn't do anything about it. I tried, I did the best I could, but <laughs> it, was, it was very hard to make good quality hay this year. Now, do you. Do you see that, do you make your first cutting early? Yes. I treat my hay fields a little bit, I, I, I really make a lot of hay off of my field, a lot of cuttings. Uh, but I see it with the organic rotation, we're going to be plowing it down. Because the alfalfa is not, the way I make hay every 28 days, and I start early and I go late, not, not, I try not to go too late. I like to have some growth there with heavy soil so the, so the alfalfa doesn't freeze out. But I usually I try to get four, at least four and usually five cuttings a year. And doing that, it's really hard on the, the alfalfa plants. Mm-hmm. But I look at it with the organic rotation going on in four years it's going to be plowed down anyway so Mm -hmm. that's kind of the way I so what are you doing for a rotation I go corn and I had been doing uh, corn uh, for uh, ear corn and then corn for silage and then uh, cover crop with hay uh, I just started doing spelt now instead of oats. Um, that's kind of what I like. And then, then hay for three, four years, kind of, kind of go by, you know, the, what the hay looks like too. Mm-hmm. And then back to corn. Mm-hmm. Do you graze your hay fields as well, or do you have all dedicated pasture? I don't graze as much of my hay fields because I have, a clay hill here where the far, the barns and the buildings are, this is all clay. And a lot of it is so rocky and so wet that we can't really 
it has to almost be permanent pasture. So I do a lot of permanent pasture for my heifers are pretty much all on permanent pasture all summer with very little else. Uh, but I do the, the dairy herd, the milking dairy herd, I do usually take eight acres and give them, rotate that through the season just, just for the dairy cows mm -hmm. that are lactating. Going back to your hay quality, is, let's say, four cuttings, do you do you consistently get hay over, let's say, 180 RFQ? Are all your cuttings over that 180 mark? Not all. This spring, my first cutting, I got a little out of hand. I made some, and then the weather would not permit for another week and a half. So my second, my second half of my first cutting was like uh, 147. And I think I had one field that kind of surprised me. It was even lower. But that was pretty unusual. My mm -hmm. first hay that I made was actually 200 RFQ. I've never seen first cutting at that. But uh, I hardly ever see under 175 or even maybe 170 after first cutting. Wow. That's Im that's impressive. The other thing I'd like to mention, you talked about in Holmes County. I try the other thing that I don't like about the sickle bar mowers and I think it's a for, for people who use TMR that's not an issue. But we don't use TMR and it's kind of you can tell a difference when you put that hay in the feeder they don't eat it as well if it's not crimped. So that's another reason. Mm. And another another thing about going back to the balers, I use a John Deere baler and almost nobody around here does. And I think it's an overlooked um, part of making hay is if you're going to make baleage, it has to be tight. So you've got the hardcore bale, not I the soft make, core. I have, my baler makes bales tighter than most. And I, I give that credit to getting it uh, cured or fermented, fermented mm -hmm. without losing as much value. So I think that's another very important thing. You know, Irvin Barkman, who was on the podcast earlier, he's a grass milk farmer in there. And his he says he makes more milk off of first cutting hay than any other cutting. Because he said all those minerals from all winter. Everything is stored in that plant. He said, if you have early, high-quality first cutting hay, best cutting of hay you can make. Now, I don't, I don't know, since you're not, he's not supplementing grain, so I'm not sure where, you know, it's probably a little bit different on a grass-fed herd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I imagine. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot... I guess the thing that I always say is timing, 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 and and also a nice tight bale, because I see can I see some pretty good hay in second, third, and even fourth cutting, uh, but a lot of my hay is so soluble this year because of not enough drying time that I have a hard time feeding it because of again no TMR, so I can't mix it in, and if you just feed it straight. So I have a bale spinner where I take two different baleages and I match them. And so I I can just hold it above the feeder and put a one kind in until I, you know, judge that it's enough. And then I put the other kind in on top of it. So the cows don't just eat one kind and gorge on this, gorge on the candy. And so there's that's another part that really... Is so you have an me. issue with too much good quality baleage is what you're saying. Well, <laughs> I guess you could say that. It's not It's a uh, wonderful it's... problem. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Are you doing any are you on a full year program or any sort of fertility program in order to get that kind of quality or has that just been what you've gotten since day one or what have you been doing to maintain that kind of thing? Well, like I told you before, earlier, that first field I made, 
I ended up hauling out with a manure spreader. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's just the soil. Um, but like I said before, I think fertility is a little bit overrated. However, I like to, we have a hog barn here, a thousand head hog barn. And I do a lot of uh, hog manure. I say a lot, not as much as I used to. I go according to soil samples, what what I think it needs. But every three to four years, I like to deck it with hog manure. And I like to keep lime and you know calcium and sulfur and boron on my hay fields. But other than that, I don't spend a lot of money on fertilizer. Okay. So, uh, you know, it seems like you've learned a lot and also had some of the neighbors kind of asking you questions as you've learned. Now, one thing that I wanted to make sure to touch on is, um, you know, you're doing something new with feeding kefir to cows. And I guess I'll just, first of all, kefir is fermented milk, essentially. it's There's grains that are used to make it into a yogurt type consistency i i like to call it high powered yogurt is basically what it what it what kefir is um but i know that i've worked with some people that have fed kefir to calves in their milk um but putting it on or with the cow ration is something new and i know that you said you've seen some interesting things uh first of all how much of that are you feeding and what have you seen so, I guess at the agronomy school this summer, uh, uh, Dr. Sylvia Abel Keynes touched on the subject of kefir for probiotics, and uh, and it kind of caught my attention with uh, too much milk and not as much money for the milk. I'm always trying to get away from what I call the university. I like to do stuff that that we do here on the farm the less dependent i am on the outside world the happier i am i guess <laughs> so sylvia talked about replacing kefir replacing probiotics with kefir and and mentioned that there's fungi and stuff that we can't buy in a bag that's also good for the cows in the kefir and it really caught my attention so i so i uh talked to her after the meeting and she uh, instructed me, and actually Brian brought me a starter for the kefir uh, starter culture. And uh, I've been feeding five gallon a five gallon bucket full every day since the middle of last summer. Uh, and I quit buying any other probiotics or um, yeast based products for for uh, bacteria in the stomach, or digestion, I guess I should say. And I've seen nothing but good results. Uh, the first thing I noticed, I guess, was the cows didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> I put it on the uh, feed. I give them their 30 pound, 15 pounds morning and evening. I give them silage, corn silage, and then I put some grain on top of that. And then we just drizzled the kefir on top and the cows didn't like it but uh, Sylvia told me just keep on feeding it it'll they'll they'll get used to it and then they'll pick it out and that's really what's happened uh, after about a week and a half all of a sudden they 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 took it without complaining and after two weeks they actually seemed to like it pretty good and the first thing I noticed was manure uh, I guess a dairy farmer learned that's another new thing for me but uh I learn a lot about my cows from the manure, and uh, usually in the fall we get diarrhea uh, from too much protein out on lush pasture. This fall I have not had a single uh, cow that would that really worried me or caught my attention. Um, their digest digestion just seems to be real good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's no different than. As humans drinking kefir, it's definitely an, an acquired taste. You know, there's a 
bitterness. There, it's a sour tasting because it's fermented. You know, it's a fermented drink. And so, but then after a while, you acquire the taste for it and really start to enjoy it. And I think it's no different than the cows. And, you know, one thing that I've been wondering is maybe just keeping that gut bacteria uh, well fed, for lack of a better term, um, and then changing feeds. I know that's one of the big things, you know, when cows change feed, they'll, they're, you know, they're, they're, they'll get an upset stomach that might lead to diarrhea essentially, you know, in, in layman's terms. Uh, but I'm wondering if maybe the kefir is providing that buffer or whatever in order to help digest that new feed that helps to, um, with the changing of feeds. Cause that would be one constant Yep. yep. in the ration. Yes, uh, the way Sylvia explained it to me um, was that so so we've got bacteria in the room and it's essentially what breaks down feed. The cow grows bacteria, and when they get too loose, their manure moves their their food moves through too fast. They lose a lot of their gut bacteria, and by feeding kefir, we are constantly reintroducing the bacteria. So they don't have to repopulate themselves as much in the rumen. So instead of they get diarrhea and the the good bacteria move out, we're uh, and then they have to regrow, basically fight against the the tide that you know as the food comes in. They have to grow faster and faster to to get back up to to normal levels. We're constantly reintroducing the the bacteria help it you know and and fungi and other good things that uh, the rumen needs Mm -hmm. so how long does kefir take so what what i do it takes about three to i usually leave about three inches of starter culture in a bucket and then fill it up with milk and and what I have is a, a five gallon pail with quarter inch holes drilled all the way around the side and the bottom, and I set that inside another b- pail with the starter in it, and then I pour it full of milk. So in 24 hours, we've got kefir at room temperature, and then I just take the bu- the top bucket out the one with uh, the sieve, I guess I could say, and let the 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 kefir all run out. And then basically what you end up with is about three to four inches of starter. You put that into the next bucket, and you got... So your starter is in your sieve? Yes. Okay, and then you just put that in another bucket, and then in 24 hours... And then hours? fill it up with milk, and in 24 hours that's ready to go, and you put it back into the other bucket. It just keeps going back and forth, and it's really pretty simple. I wash the bucket when we're done with uh, wash water from the pipeline and, you know, soap and then acid, and, and it's all nice and clean because and, it really gets kind of smelly if we don't <laughs> stay on top of cleanliness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kefir is something that, well, like you said, I think we're, we don't know everything that's in it. And, um, nor do we have to, we, we know it's doing something good and it's that probiotic that, um, like you said, you just cannot buy it in a bag. You can certainly buy probiotics in a bag that will help to replace, but there's something in that live active culture that, uh, is really beneficial to everybody, Uh, you know, cows, humans, whoever. So when you look at your mineralization in your soils, in your feed, in the milk, being reintroduced back to the cow, so you've got a completely closed system here. You're not bringing in somebody else's milk that would have different bacteria in it. Your cows, you're you're building up all the bacteria that your cows need with your own product. That's why I, I think... The best feed that you can possibly give your cow is feed 
from your farm where the cow is used to the mineralization and everything. And I think kefir would just make sense to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. That was and, and another thing that I've noticed, and I don't know if I want to credit the kefir too much yet, but, you know, theoretically, uh, mastitis, um, the bugs are around us in the air, on our hands, whatever, that cause mastitis. Uh, we had on our second lactation was super. We seldom had a somatic cell of a hundred thousand. It was below. It was seventy to ninety thousand consistently. And the third lactation came around, and I was maybe even a little bit arrogant about it. Uh, third lactation came around, and wow. Yeah, we tried to keep it under two fifty. We were happy. Uh, we did DHI consistently, and it was kind of a rough year. Milk prices came down, somatic cell went up, and we couldn't, like like we talked about earlier, we couldn't get rid of cows. And I, I had a few people out to check out my system. I thought, well, maybe my milking system's not working properly. And I found out that it's hard to get somebody out here that really knows in detail how to check that but i finally did get somebody out this summer that had a had a computer that he hooked up to every milker and checked every aspect of every milker and we found quite a bit of uh, flaws in the system took care of it in the meantime our cows started coming in with fourth lactation we had eight out of 38 cows we had eight of them three-quartered by the time the third lactation was over. And it was pretty depressing. Um, we had so many plugs to put in and milkers, we didn't know where we were going some days. The fourth lactation came around with the kefir. Um, they came back, and sure enough, they still had the mastitis. I tried to take some extra precautions and, and milked them a few extra times and threw dry off to try and maybe, maybe the mastitis will clear off. They came back with mastitis, sure enough. And I thought, well, we're going to give these cows a little bit of a chance. They had not been getting any kefir while they were dry. And guess what? In eight days, I couldn't believe it. I checked the first cow that came through, like that was that went out three-quartered, and we just milked her in the bucket and fed her milk to the calves. And eight days later, I checked it with the CMT paddle, and I said, it's it's leaving. It's it's better. It looks like it's on its way out. And a few days later, we checked it again, and it was gone. And we have had, I'm not, I didn't keep definite track, but I would say at least three to five, at least four, possibly five cows that went out three-quarter and came back in. And within 12 days, the one cow took three weeks or so, um, they're milking all four quarters back in the tank. Was it the milking system that caused it? I don't know, but I know that it wasn't the milking system that took it away. I'm kind of thinking maybe the kefir's doing more than just digest digestion. Mm -hmm. Are you starting to feed kefir to the dry cows or no? I didn't. Uh, I guess if they want to clear up eight days after they're fresh or to 12 days, I'm happy with You're that. You're fine with that? <laughs> <laughs> so I still have a few three-quarter cows out there one or two that are dry but uh, yeah I don't know how those will be yet that's pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah. I have not developed a taste for kefir yet you know it's kind of funny with with uh, and I know you don't have a sweet tooth but with Amish guys I don't know if though a lot of them will ever gain a taste for kefir because of that sour taste a lot of amish guys have a significant sweet tooth <laughs> well i smell it every morning and i just haven't i haven't ever actually reached in and, t and tasted it <laughs> so your cows get it but you don't <laughs> i want healthy cows <laughs> no i can I, I can drink a kefir smoothie oh i think they're okay um but I would never order one. 
No. I can. We we actually make our own yogurt here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like that, and I think if kefir would be sweetened a little bit, or yep. I could probably mm-hmm. do that. But we just I have my yogurt with my cereal, and that's what we use. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for sharing with us, and uh, we hope you ever continue. You are able to continue to try to thrive. I know now is a more difficult time than usual on top of being a heifer startup but it sounds like you're asking a lot of good questions and learning a lot and hopefully um you know you can continue with that so thanks a lot for sharing today and thanks for sitting down with us yeah thank you i appreciate it i'm i need to bring you to ohio to talk about forage quality sometime (laughs) thank you well i say thanks to you guys it's been a pleasure